Hello and welcome, I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we're looking at the NICE updates published in April 2024, focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. And in April, we have had very little guidance, which is new and relevant to primary care. In fact, there was only one guideline containing relevant information for us, the guideline on endometriosis. But to make up for it, we also have the NICE final draft guidance on atogepant for migraine prophylaxis, which I will cover briefly after the endometriosis update. Right, let's jump into it. So let's start with the guideline on endometriosis. The management is normally guided by secondary care, but this guideline also includes recommendations relevant to primary care, such as the clinical presentation, diagnosis and referral recommendations. So let's have a look at the clinical presentation. NICE says that we should suspect endometriosis in women, including those aged 17 and under, if they have at least one of the following. Chronic pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, deep pain during or after sexual intercourse, and either period-related or cyclical gastrointestinal and urinary symptoms, in particular painful bowel movements, hematuria or dysuria. We will offer an abdominal examination to exclude masses, and if appropriate, a pelvic and vaginal examination too. What investigation should be organised? Well, we can do a transvaginal ultrasound which can identify signs of endometriosis. If a transvaginal scan is not appropriate, we will do a transabdominal pelvic ultrasound scan. We will not use serum CA125 to diagnose endometriosis, but if it is available, we must be aware that a high level may be consistent with endometriosis, but that endometriosis may be present despite normal CA125 levels. Equally, pelvic MRI is not recommended as a primary investigation for endometriosis. However, this can be considered in secondary care to assess the extent of deep endometriosis involving the bowel, bladder and ureter. But, and this is an important but, we must not exclude endometriosis just because the examination, ultrasound or MRI scans are normal. If there is a high clinical suspicion, we should refer for further assessment. So the question is, should we be initiating investigations in primary care if we know that we may end up referring to gynaecology anyway? And my view is that if there is a high clinical suspicion of endometriosis, then we're probably better off referring the patient straight away as this is likely to lead to an earlier diagnosis and management. However, if we're not certain or we wish to exclude other possible diagnoses, we could do some investigations first. And when do we need to refer? And the answer is simple. We should refer if they have symptoms or signs suggestive of endometriosis or if they're not responding to the initial management. There are new and updated management recommendations if fertility is a priority and these are obviously more relevant for secondary care. From a primary care perspective, we should know that, in general, surgical approaches are recommended because they are likely to improve the chance of spontaneous pregnancy. However, the opposite is true for hormonal treatment, either alone or in combination with surgery, so it is not recommended because of its effect on reducing fertility. And that is it. This is the only published update for us. But, as promised, Let's have a look at the nice final draft on a touch band for migraine prophylaxis. I will not say very much because we will be covering this fully when the final guidance is published, but I will give you just an overview. Both Rumejepant and Atogepant are a new class of drugs, also known as Chepans, that have been developed specifically for the management of migraine. They are a calcitonin gene-related peptide or CGRP receptor antagonist which works by blocking the CGRP receptor. And although the mechanism of action is not fully understood, we know that the CGRP is a protein found in the sensory nerves of the head and neck and causes blood vessels to dilate, which can lead to inflammation and migraine pain. Unlike triptans, Japans do not cause vasoconstriction, so they do not have the same cardiovascular contraindications and cautions as triptans. Japans can be used as an acute treatment of migraine and, although Remegepant has a license for migraine prophylaxis, NICE only recommends it as prophylaxis of episodic migraines. However, 
NICE has recommended atorgepant as an option for preventing both chronic and episodic migraines. But this is only if there have been at least four migraine days per month and where at least three previous preventative treatments have failed. What's the difference between episodic and chronic migraine? The definition of episodic migraine is when there are fewer than 15 headache days each month. On the other hand, chronic migraine is when there is at least 15 headache days a month, with at least eight of those having features of migraine. Currently, the most effective options for people with chronic migraines who have already tried three prophylactic treatments are drugs that need to be injected. So, neural treatments such as atorgepant offers more choice for patients. So, with that in mind, let's quickly look at the preventative treatment pathway that NICE has produced in the new draft guidance. First, for prophylaxis treatment to be considered, the patient needs to have at least four or more migraine days per month. In that case, we will give first, second and third line prophylaxis with propranolol, amitriptyline and topiramate. If there is inadequate response, then we move to fourth line treatment. For episodic migraine, we can give remegepant. For both episodic and chronic migraines, we have a number of injectable medications and atogepant as the only oral medication. Finally, if it is only chronic migraine, then the recommended treatment will be with Botox. Remegepant is an oral lafilisate that should be placed on the tongue or under the tongue and it will disintegrate in the mouth and can therefore be taken without liquid. However, atogepant is a tablet to be taken orally. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.